ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Sandy Quinn. I'm president of the Richard Nixon Foundation. Thank you all for coming. I want to introduce some special guests, starting with our treasurer and member of the board of directors, John Barr. John. <laughs> Uh, we're, we're honored tonight to have the architect of the Ronald Reagan election as governor and later as president. Nobody was closer to Ronald Reagan in his political career than Stu Spencer. Stu, thank you. We're also honored to have the Chairman Emeritus of the Orange County Republican Party, Lois Lundberg. And with all that talk about national politics, I want you to say hello to Gene Hernandez, a uh, police officer here for 35 years. He was part of our grand opening, the two memorial services, and he's a candidate for city council, Gene Hernandez. <laughs> now, we have given you tonight this attractive four-color brochure, free, free. <laughs> this brochure tells you how you can order copies of the ten books by President Richard Nixon. All ten, the Richard Nixon Foundation is reprinting as part of our centennial celebration. And they'll be available in time for holiday giving, perfect gifts as sets in leather bound or individual paperback editions, and they're uh, unabridged, they're the full text uh, with uh, uh, commentary by the president written after their original publication. But it's everything from six crises which was his first book uh, to, uh, to memoirs and his later books. So take this and if you'd like to order them uh, and have them as uh, Christmas gifts, we'd be delighted to accommodate you. <coughs> All reasonably priced. Now, also special for you tonight, another free brochure. This one, this one inviting you to become members of the Nixon Associates Club, or President's Council, or Cabinet. Now many of you are members here tonight, but those of you who aren't, I really urge you to, to join us and help us do the things that we do nationally to illuminate and protect uh, the Richard Nixon legacy. And we uh, give you special discounts we give you invitations to special events. Uh, you get uh, a, a lesser price tickets for events like this. And the many benefits are described in detail. There's so many of them, we really didn't have space to print them all. You can, you can imagine them or call me and I'll tell you about them. But the, the foundation needs your help. Please join. Now, if you do it tonight, after the lecture, Tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm at Costco. <laughs> Tell you what I'm going to do. We have, just days before the election, we have bobbleheads. We have President Obama and we have, we have George Romney. These are great conversation starters. Put one of these. Put, or argument starters, what, whatever. But um, join tonight and you'll get one of these free. While supplies last, we only have two. But uh, <laughs> no, I, I was kidding. But we do have them uh, for you tonight. There's um, attractive hostesses in the lobby with these applications. Please join up. If you join tonight, you'll get one of these free with your membership. Now, I want to tell you about some of the things coming up. Um, we have, of course, as you, many of you know, on November 1st, we have Denise 
D'Souza, who's coming for his uh, uh, another bestseller, as uh, Ed Klein's The Amateur is. And Denise comes um, uh, after weeks and weeks on the bestseller lists of both Publishers Weekly and the New York Times. He'll speak here from this very stage at 7 o'clock on November 1st. So uh, get your tickets now. It'll be a sellout. He's the one who produced that movie. If you haven't seen it, please go see it, and you'll find out uh, all kinds of things you didn't know about the direction of this, of this country. Uh, on October 23rd, we have Robert Gray, who has spent a lifetime in Washington, D.C. as a political insider. He was secretary to the cabinet under President Eisenhower, and it was very involved with the Reagan administration in charge of one of his inaugurations, and a close friend of the, of the Reagans for years, and all presidents, actually, coming here for his new book, which is Presidential Perks Gone Wild, telling you about the things that are available to presidents that he feels are being abused. Uh, we have on, uh, on uh, November 11th, the course is Veterans Day, and we always do a free day on that. And we have this year former National Security Advisor Bud McFarlane, and he'll be speaking at 11 o'clock. Uh, we also have a concert by the Placentia Symphonic Band at 3, so we hope you'll you'll come to, uh, come to those. And then we have uh, on, um, on January 6th a free admission day because that's the day we're celebrating President Nixon's centennial birthday. And we will have Tricia Nixon Cox here at 11 o'clock for a wreath lane. And we'll have a concert by the Marine Band at at one o'clock, it'll be a great event, it's free, so uh, please join us, it's a Sunday. On January 9th, if you happen to be in Washington, D.C. on business or pleasure, join us at the Mayflower as we celebrate Richard Nixon's 100th birthday gala in the ballroom where he had his two inaugurations. Then, on January 31st, from three to six, we have KABC's very popular talk show host, Larry Elder, doing a live broadcast in this very room. Uh, and again, it's free. He'll be signing his new book. Uh, and I hope you'll join us on that day. Now, our speaker. You thought I'd never get to it. The, I know the question all of you have wondered is, how did President Obama do so bad on that debate? And I know the answer. That afternoon, during the prep, he decided to take a little time off, and he picked up the nearest book on the, bu on the, on the, on the coffee table, and it was the amateur. <laughs> it ruined his day. It ruined the night. Every single person you know, particularly the undecideds, have to read this book. It is, it is absolutely astounding, every page of it, on what's happened to our White House and to our government, to our foreign policy, and most important, to the future of America. So the author, who's been on the bestseller list for weeks and weeks of this great book, is Ed Klein. He's written books about the Kennedys. He wrote a great book about Hillary Clinton. Uh, he's been commenting on Hillary in the last, uh, the, the Clintons in the last few days, you might have, have noticed. He was the Newsweek foreign editor. He was editor-in-chief of the New York Times Magazine. He's a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. And we have him here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ed Klein. bobbleheads for you. I wish I did. Thank you, Sandy. That was a nice, 
warm introduction. I want to thank the trustees and the supporters of this wonderful, wonderful library for inviting me to speak here tonight. How are you all feeling? I hope you're all feeling good. I hope you uh, are in a relatively good mood about this election. I think, um, if I may say so, our side has a chance. You know, my appearance here tonight at the Nixon Library is something of a um, intellectual and career professional homecoming for me. Richard Nixon's elevation to the presidency in January of 1969 coincided almost to the day with my own advancement to the post of foreign editor of Newsweek magazine. For five and a half years, until Watergate drove Nixon from office, I followed President Nixon's foreign policy on a day-to-day, -day, sometimes even an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Those were the glory days of Newsweek, when Newsweek was still a um, straight magazine. I'm not talking about sexual orientation here, by the way. <laughs> Those were the days when Newsweek was a major player, an influencer, if you will, in domestic affairs and in the conduct of American foreign policy. As foreign editor, I had 27 full-time correspondents at my beck and call, about half a dozen of them in Saigon, as you might imagine, plus a large troop of seasoned reporters in the White House, the Pentagon, the State Department, the CIA, all over Washington. It was a challenging assignment. For, as you, I'm sure, know, President Nixon's time in office was not only marked by domestic division, but also by international turmoil. America's post-war dominance in foreign affairs was under assault. And the question facing President Nixon and his national security advisor and eventually Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was how the United States, which was bogged down in a war in Indochina, how the United States could seize the initiative in international affairs and articulate a long range reasonable, well-thought-out philosophy and objectives. You may all know that Nixon had little confidence in the State Department. He believed that its personnel had no loyalty to him. As Henry Kissinger has pointed out, the Foreign Service had disdained Nixon as Vice President and ignored him the moment he was out of office. Nick, uh, Kissinger went on to say, he was determined to run foreign policy from the White House. In this one regard, Nixon's determination to run foreign policy from the White House, Nixon and Barack Obama have a great deal in common. In my book, The Amateur, I point out that no president since Richard Nixon has taken more personal control over foreign policy than Barack Obama. I write, this is an Obama-centric decision-making operation. In other administrations, a lot of decisions were made below the presidential level, but Obama shapes most policies. Those same words could be used to describe the decision-making operation on foreign policy in the Nixon White House. However, there the similarities end. Obama's foreign policy, in my view, has been erratic and inconsistent. On the one hand, he has been timid and passive in the face of challenges from Russia, China, Iran, and Syria. On the other hand, he has aggressively pursued al-Qaeda through the use of unmanned drones and clandestine, clandestine special op troops. But as I think 
President Nixon would have been the first to say, a series of ad hoc military operations do not add up to a successful foreign policy. Effective diplomacy requires something that is sorely missing in Barack Obama's foreign policy, and that something was the very core of Richard Nixon's foreign policy, a coherent philosophy and world view. Tonight I want to give you a coherent view of Barack Obama, the man, his political philosophy, and his worldview. I titled my book The Amateur, a reporter's book. In the course of researching the book, I interviewed nearly 200 people, present and former members of the current administration, members of the White House press corps, Democrats and Republicans on Capitol Hill, foreign policy experts, and African-American political leaders in Chicago. A number of these African-American leaders urged me to interview the Reverend Jeremiah Wright, Barack Obama's minister for more than 20 years. I told them that I wouldn't be comfortable speaking to a man who delivered those hate-filled sermons against America, against white people, against Jews, against Israel, at times it seemed against everybody and everything. But they told me, Mr. Klein, you've got to go see the Reverend Wright because he has an important story to tell you that no one else has ever heard. And so off I went to meet the notorious Reverend Jeremiah Wright in his office at the Kwame Nkrumah Academy, named after the late Marxist dictator of Ghana. Very appropriate. The Kwame Nkrumah Academy. He was well-dressed softly spoken, under control, and we sat down. I asked him, I said, um, Reverend Wright, would you mind if I use a tape recorder? And he said, no, he didn't mind. We had a three-hour interview, and I've released the entire tape recording of that interview to the press. I don't think any of you in this room will be surprised to learn that except for Sean Hannity on Fox News Channel, the media has completely ignored this interview. Completely ignored it. ABC, CBS, NBC, not a word. CNN, not a word. The New York Times, Washington Post, go on and on and on. And this interview was full of new information and important things that had never been reported before. For instance, the Reverend Wright told me that Barack Obama first came to him in the 1980s, and when he did, he was, quote, quoting the Reverend Wright, steeped in Islam. Those were his exact words. He was steeped in Islam. Obama, he said, knew a lot about Islam from his childhood in Indonesia and his stepfather's Muslim family. But, the Reverend Wright said, again on the record, tape recording, the whole thing, he didn't know much about Christianity. The Reverend Wright told me, quote, I offered to bring him to an understanding of Christ. I asked the Reverend Wright whether he believed that he had actually converted Barack Obama from Islam to Christianity. And his, these were his exact words. It's hard to say. It's hard to say. He did not deny that he had converted him. He didn't say that he had, but he certainly didn't say that he hadn't. He left me with the impression that he himself wasn't quite clear, that there was a question in the mind of this minister whether he had actually 
converted him. So he went on. He converted him. He didn't convert him. He then went on to say, but that's not entirely important because Barack and Michelle Obama are not church people. These are quotes. I'm not paraphrasing now. Church is not important to them. They didn't even send their daughters to Sunday school. Now, some of you may know that United, Trinity United Church of Christ, the Reverend uh, Wright's Black Liberation Theology Church, with, with its 8,000 affluent and politically connected members, that that church was not really a spiritual home for Barack Obama. It was his political base. That's why he joined that church. And when the Reverend Wright became a political embarrassment to Obama in 2008, after those videotapes of him ranting and raving and GDing America and ranting against Jews and Israel and Christians and whites, and after Obama threw the Reverend Wright under the bus, Wright told me that he got an email from Barack Obama's best friend. This man's name is Eric Whitaker. He's the vice president of the University of Chicago Medical Center, and he plays basketball with Barack Obama. He and his wife go on vacations with Barack Obama. He often flies on the campaign plane with Obama. You don't get any closer as a friend than he is. And the Reverend Wright said that Eric Whitaker sent him an email offering him $150,000 if he would shut up. Or to put it more politely, if he would remain silent during the remainder of the 2008 campaign. The Reverend Wright turned down the bribe. He then got a phone call from, guess who? The man who threw him under the bus, Barack Obama. Obama said that he would like to meet the Reverend Wright in a secure location, meaning that he didn't want anybody to know that they were going to meet. He wanted it to be a secret meeting. He didn't want the press to know about it. Didn't want it to be public secret meeting. The Reverend Wright said, why do we need a secret meeting? You've been to my home a hundred, hundreds, sorry, hundreds of times, one-on-one -on -one meetings in his home. You can meet me right here in the parsonage. And so Barack Obama got into a Secret Service SUV and was taken over to the parsonage of the Trinity United Church of Christ, and for the next hour, he spent begging the Reverend Wright to stop talking in public and embarrassing him. And the Reverend Wright said, according to this tape-recorded interview, I can't do that. I've got to remain true to my principles. And Obama said, you know what the trouble with you is, Rev? called him Rev. You know what the trouble with you is, Rev? Your trouble is that you've got to tell the truth. <laughs> and the Reverend Wright said, that's not a bad problem for a minister to have. You should have such a problem yourself. <laughs> now, I've gone on at some length talking about the Reverend Wright and Barack Obama because I think their relationship tells us a lot about the kind of man we have today in the White House. This is a man who sat at the knee of the Reverend Wright for 23 years, not as has been reported in a pew at that church so much, but in the Reverend Wright's home. And he listened to the Reverend Wright he listened to him spin his Marxist theories of black liberation theology, a theology that believes there is an oppressor class, whites, and an oppressed class, blacks, 
and that America needs to redistribute wealth and power. That may sound a little familiar to people here in the room tonight. Redistribute. Where have you heard that before? Redistribution. Hmm. I think we've heard that before. This comes from the Reverend Wright in Black Liberation Theology, which, by the way, as I've already said, has, Marxist, has a Marxist basis. So is it any surprise that I concluded in my book that President Obama is actually in revolt against the values of a society that elected him to lead it, which is why he has refused to embrace American exceptionalism, the idea that Americans are a special people with a special destiny, and why he has railed at the capitalist system, demonized the wealthy, embraced the Occupy Wall Street movement, and most recently, of course, demonized Mitt Romney because he's been a successful entrepreneur. In, a, in addition to being the most divisive and radical left-wing president we have ever had in our history, Obama is also, in my view, an amateur. He is at bottom temperamentally unsuited to be the chief executive and commander in chief of the United States of America. He is something new in American politics, the amateur in the White House. We've never seen that before. A president who is inept in the arts of management and governance, who doesn't learn from his mistakes, and who therefore repeats his mistakes over and over again and makes our economy less robust and our nation less safe. That combination of radical ideology and bungling amateur, that combination is a toxic mix. I'm reminded of um, President Ronald Reagan and the difference he, between him and Barack Obama. At the end of the day, any typical day, Ronald Reagan would pick up the phone and call Tip O'Neill, the Democratic Speaker of the House of Representatives. He'd say, hey, Tip, why don't you come on over and have a drink in the White House? Now, these two men had very little in common ideologically and politically. They saw the world in a very different light. But they sat down in the White House over a bottle of whiskey, had a couple of drinks, told stories. They loved, both of them loved to tell stories. Reminisced about the old days. Talked about their families. How's your daughter? How's your son? How's your uncle and your aunt and so forth? And after a while, they would get down to the business of America. And Reagan would turn to him and he'd say, hey, Tip, I'd like to get this bill passed. What is, what is it going to take to get your boys to vote for it? And Tip, no fool, would say, well, Mr. President, there are some things in that bill I just can't get them to vote for. Now, that's not true. He could get them to vote for pretty much anything he wanted, but he didn't like the bill. Well, what is it in the bill you don't like? Well, I don't well, maybe we could make a little tweak here, change here. I'll give you my word, Tip, that if you can bring these boys along, most of them in those days were boys, by the way, not, there weren't too many women there. I'll, um, I'll, I'll change some of the wording in the bill. And they'd work things out on the basis of mutual respect and trust personal relationship, they do the business of America. Can you imagine Barack Obama having that kind of relationship with John Boehner, <laughs> the current Speaker of the House? I can't. By his very nature, Obama is unable to reach out beyond his, beyond his tight inner circle of Chicago operatives. 
and reach common cause with Republicans on Capitol Hill. If you read the mainstream media, they'll tell you that it's the Republicans who have been obstructionist and have stopped poor Barack Obama from getting things done in Washington. I don't, for one, buy that at all. I don't think it's the Republicans who have largely blocked progress in Washington. And in fact, my reporting proved just the opposite. I spoke to a very top aide to the Republican House leadership, and he told me, and I'll quote him, every modern president, perhaps with the exception of Jerry Ford, entered the White House with a large quotient of self-assurance and arrogance. It takes a lot of self-assurance and arrogance to even run for president. Jerry Ford didn't run. But what makes this president, Obama, unique is that he is so far beyond self-assurance and arrogance. This insider continued, not only is Obama self-assured, the smartest guy in the room, but in his estimation, all he has to do is state something and the scales will fall from your eyes. Despite the storyline people create that he is a thoughtful, non-ideological, middle-of-the-road kind of guy. And you see all this, you hear all this, by the way, in the mainstream media. He's not far left wing, he's moderate. He's a moderate guy. He just wants to compromise and get things done. Listen, he has a distinct leftist ideology, and he can't make a decision that takes him out of his comfort zone, his ideological comfort zone. He's got so little appreciate, I'm continuing to quote this guy now. This is a member of the leadership, well, he's an aide to the leadership of the Republican leadership. He, meaning Obama, he's got so little appreciation and knowledge of how Congress works that it's an equal branch of government. If you challenge him, he's furious. He gives you what we have come to call the death stare. He has no close relationships with any member of the Senate, and certainly not in the House. I might add, by the way, here, that he has no close relationships with foreign leaders, either. He doesn't have relationships, period. John Boehner says that in his 20 years in Washington, he's been through four administrations, and that this one is completely to him opaque. He doesn't know who makes the decisions there and how they make them in the Obama White House. By all accounts, Obama was elected to a job for which he has little relish. He doesn't find joy in being president. Like Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter, Obama is essentially an introvert. In Obama's case, he prefers, prefers his own company to that of others. He does. He's much more comfortable. He is someone who finds extended contact with groups of people outside his immediate circle to be draining. He can rouse a stadium of 20,000 people who are shouting and pouring their adoration on him. But that audience is an impersonal monolith. Smaller group settings can be much harder for him. I interviewed a former State Department official who told me, <clears throat> while I was in the room with uh, Obama, he'd get these phone calls from heads of state and heads of government. And more than once I heard him say, I can't believe that I've got to meet with all these congressmen from Podunk City to get my bills passed. This is to foreign heads of state, the condescension. And when the meeting was over with Obama, it was over, the State Department official said. There was no lingering, no schmoozing on the way out. There was no clinging to personal relationships as there was, say, with Bill Clinton. Now, I heard the same complaint from people who raised 
hundreds of thousands of dollars for Obama during the last election, 2008. I went to Chicago and I interviewed a major, major bundler, fundraiser for Obama in the American Jewish community in Chicago. We sat there and I had my reporter's pad out and my pencil and I was taking notes an hour and a half, poured uh, adoration on Obama. He was so great. Everything he did was fantastic. He was a great president. He loved him. He was going to raise money for him again in 2012. Closed my book, put my pen away, got up, and he said, let me um, escort you to the elevator. And on the way to the elevator, he stopped and he put his arm, he was short, so he couldn't put his arm around my shoulder, but put his arm on my back and he said, you know something? My friends in the Jewish community who raise tons of money for Obama complain to me that they never, ever hear from him. He never answers their phone calls. He's not like Bill Clinton, who used to call them and ask them about their wives and grandchildren and businesses. I said, what about you? You, you, know, you just spent the last hour and a half telling me how great he was. And you know what he said? I don't hear from him either. I don't ever hear from him. He never picks up the phone and calls me. So what does all this say about a president who hates the day-to-day, -day, the give and take of politics, who doesn't have respect for members of Congress, who doesn't show loyalty to those who supported him with their money, time, and organizational skills? What does this say about a president who doesn't show any gratitude, who has frozen Oprah Winfrey out of the White House and Carolyn Kennedy out of the White House and those other people who were there from him, for him. What does it say about a president who has ignored the African-American base, his African-American base, to the point where literally every single African-American businessman and leader I interviewed for my book not people on the street, but leaders. Educated, successful, powerful people. Every single African American told me they were disappointed and disillusioned with the country's first black president. I think it speaks volumes about his character and about his inflated self-image. This is going to be my final little story, and then I'll sum up. On the evening of Tuesday, June 30th, 2009, Obama invited nine like-minded liberal historians to have dinner with him in the family quarters of the White House. June 30th, 2009. He was inaugurated in January. As this group dug into their lamb chops, Obama wasn't shy about flaunting his famous self-confidence. He boasted that he intended to bring the Israelis and the Palestinians to the negotiating table and create a permanent peace in the Middle East. Not only that, he would open constructive dialogue with America's enemies in Iran and North Korea. And, there was, and through his powers, his special magical, wonderful powers of persuasion. He'd help these Iranians and North Koreans and Syrians and other enemies of America see the errors of their ways. He'd inject the regulatory hand of the federal government into the American economy and make it a more equitable society. Now, when several of the historians who were there that evening, and these were all liberal historians, mind you, not one conservative historian was invited, they brought up the difficulties, very politely, that Lyndon Johnson had when he was pursuing a war in Indochina and trying to wage an ambitious domestic agenda at home. So how is it Barack Obama, with two wars, going to pull this off? Obama immediately grew testy. Now, the historians hadn't talked about 
the death stare, so I can't say they, they use that phrase, but he grew testy. He knew better. He could prevail by force of his personality. He could solve the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, put millions of people back to work, redistribute the wealth, withdraw from Iraq, and reconcile the United States to a less dominant role in the world so that we would not be hated all over the place. It was by any measure a breathtaking display of narcissistic grandiosity from a man whose entire political career consisted of seven undistinguished years in the Illinois State Senate, two mostly absent years in the United States Senate, and a grand total of five months and 10 days in the White House. Unintentionally, Barack Obama revealed the characteristics that made him totally unsuited for the presidency and would doom him to failure. His extreme haughtiness and excessive pride, his ideologically bent as a far left wing corporatist, and my friends, his astounding amateurism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Klein has agreed to answer a few questions, so if you'll raise your hand, I will bring the mic to you, and if you will stand and state your question and not make a speech, he'll be glad to answer it. Thank you, Mr. Klein. That was very good. My question is, listening to everything you've described, where did Barack Obama get this ego from? I mean, <laughs> because he had, and maybe I'm amateur in, in my thoughts, but somebody or something, he had really his, really no parent influence. So where do you, where do you think he got this from? Well, you'd have to be, a, I think, a psychoanalyst to answer that question, which I'm not. Um, there have been books written about this. He came from a very, very dysfunctional family. I don't want to go through the whole thing. You all know the father left. The mother was, on, <clears throat> was basically abandoned him to the grandparents. The grandparents, this is not so well known, were alcoholics, both of them. The grandfather was best friends with a African-American communist poet who he introduced to Barack Obama. Barack Obama had a lot of trouble, I think, figuring out who he was, what his place in the world was. I mean, he's written about this, or he had somebody else write about it, depending on your point of view. <laughs> I think he's a very complicated guy. He's not the guy you see in public. That much I can tell you without being a psychoanalyst. As I've said, in public, he turns on the charm, Give him an audience like this, or a little large, he, he prefers them a little larger than this, who you know are cheering and waving and giving him love, and he comes out. But in person, he is very introverted. You cannot do the business of America in Washington unless you have relationships. He has no real relationships, except as far as we know, with his wife and his daughters. And um, that relationship with uh, Michelle, which I've written about also in my book, and I'm not gonna go into it this moment, but that is a peculiar relationship in, in itself too. So he's, um, in my view, he's a bit of a damaged personality. And I think it's come out in his l lack of leadership abilities. Odd, is there an odd couple relationship between Barack Obama and Bill Clinton? Yes. <laughs> Bill Clinton thought 
Hillary was entitled to be President of the United States. Barack Obama stole that from her. Bill Clinton thought that he, and I think with some reason, was very popular in the African American community. Barack Obama, African American, and his team referred to Bill Clinton as a racist. There's a lot of bad blood between the Clintons and the Obamas. But Bill Clinton has his eye on the prize. He had, the prize is 2016, when he hopes, and he's told all his intimate friends and associates that he intends to run Hillary for president of the United States. And if Hillary can recover her, you know, she's exhausted and she's overweight and she needs to, rec you know, recuperate, <clears throat> which I think she's capable of doing, she probably will run in 2016. He needed the Democratic Party apparatus behind him. He went out, decided to campaign for Barack Obama despite his feelings about him. My book is named The Amateur, which was Bill Clinton, who called him that in the first place. So he doesn't like his policies. He doesn't think he knows what he's doing, but he needs the the party has shifted since Clinton was president from some centrists to almost all left-wingers. There's very few Democratic centrists left. So Bill has to follow the army over to the left and be a good soldier. So they have a very peculiar relationship, but politics makes strange bedfellows. Uh, Mr. Klein, a questioner in the center, sir. Yes, I'm wondering if you could just give us your assessment of the debate. There are you know, two sides to the debate, the liberal and the conservative side, but you know, what, what did you see in the debate, given your assessment of uh, Obama, and what do you think is going to happen in the next two debates? Uh, Bill Clinton uh, called the White House before the first debate because he heard that Barack Obama was not taking his prep debate prep seriously enough, offered to help out, never heard back from the White House. Never heard back. <clears throat> uh, I think Barack Obama will come more prepared for the second debate, but he has a lot of problems. He can prepare and prepare and prepare, but he still has to defend his domestic policies and his foreign policies. I think we will see an energized Mitt Romney, go after him on both those policies. I think Obama will do a bit better. I think at best he can get a draw. I don't think he can possibly win. He does not like a debate situations where people tell him he's not the greatest. <laughs> so I think it's going to be lively, but I doubt that we're going to see a new, new Obama. Mr. Klein, over to your right. Mr. Klein, uh, perhaps you can help me with this. I've read your book. I've read another six or seven conservative books. Uh, I preach <laughs> to the choir sometimes. I talk to my conservative friends. They understand completely. I speak to some of my liberal friends, and they have a closed mind. No matter what I tell them, they go, no, no, no. You're watching too much Fox, or you're, you're spending too much time talking to your conservative friends. Uh, you don't see the true picture. I, I'm confused. I don't know what I tell these people anymore. Uh, we've had the, all the problems with Fast and Furious. We've had the problems with Libya. My question is, what do I say to these people to open their minds? I'm frustrated. I would urge you to save your breath. <laughs> On a more serious note, I don't think they can be persuaded. I think it's in their very, the whoop, woof and warp, warp, whatever the phrase is, of their nature. It's, um, it's like arguing about religion back in the 17th century, you know. I mean, you're not going to persuade these people. Um, I think 
Romney was correct when he said they're about 47 percent or thereabouts of the people he is not going to reach, no matter what. And I don't think you will either. I think there are some people, however, small number and a small, small percentage, though they may be, in the middle, who are reachable, the so-called persuadables, people whose minds are still open. Those are the people I would spend my time and effort because they are open, more open-minded. But that M MSNBC crowd, it's a lost cause. A lady to your right. Thank you for coming. I have a question. Last week you stated, with all of our problems, that uh, you thought the government would put Hillary under the bus because of the four people that were killed or murdered. Today she admitted that she will take the blame. I would like to know your comments on that situation. Okay, that's a good question. Today, Hillary Clinton, somewhere in South America, wasn't it? Peru. Peru. I guess that's in South America. <laughs> Wait, just a minute. Said, I am ultimately responsible for this and I take full responsibility. Uh, folks, this is, this is the Clinton speaking. You have to remember, this is the same family that, that okay. gave us some, de depends on what the definition of is is. <laughs> I don't believe for two seconds that Hillary Clinton is going to leave it at that. I don't believe it. I, I can't believe it. This is not in their character. For them, what does that mean? I'm responsible. I take all blame. I'm giving up. I'm not going to run for president. Bill and I are going to go to Chappaqua, and we're going to urge Chelsea to have a child so we can play with our grandchild. No. <laughs> not going to happen. There is, I don't know what it is. I wish I could tell you. But I'm sure there is a plan. And I think this is the first shot in that plan, whatever it might be. And I think we will see it unfold in the, day, in the next days to come. The Clintons are not going to lie down and take this all on them. They're going to take some others, including, I believe, the president, with them. Mr. Klein, could you comment basically on the day-to-day -day relationship with Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama while she was serving, or while she is serving as his Secretary of State? And secondly, my follow-up question is, how does this uh, revelation with Hillary taking the blame change, the, uh, change what may happen here in the 2012 election, if anything? The, on the surface, the relationship between Obama and Hillary has been very courteous. They've gone, both gone out of the ways, not to, not to uh, leave the impression that there's any friction between them. She was chosen in part to keep Bill quiet, and, and, she, and that has worked until recently, bringing them both under the tent so that Bill would not be outside the tent. Uh, criticizing Obama. Do stand? Uh, let me just finish this, if I may. I'll try not to be long-winded about it. But behind the scenes, according to my sources, there has been a lot of disagreement between them as far as, as far, foreign policy is concerned. Foreign policy is, as I said in my speech, being um, engineered from the White House. The State Department has been forced to follow that foreign policy. But Hillary has, is much more um, active, aggressive, engaged in the use of American, projection of American strength than Obama. And I think that's been the cause of a lot of friction behind the scenes. To get you to your second point, I think if uh, Hillary and Obama, I don't know this to be the case, but if Hillary and Obama have talked about who's going to take blame for this, and she said what she said in Peru, tomorrow night we may see, I'm not saying we will, Obama saying, well, as my Secretary of State said, she takes, so do I. I'm the president, and the buck stops here. 
I think he's going to try, in other words, to defang Romney's attack on Benghazi Gate. We'll see if it works or not. I don't think it's that simple because the administration lied for a couple of weeks about whether they knew whether there was a security problem there and whether it was caused by this 15-minute video, which is absurd, or whether it was an Al-Qaeda-affiliated attack, which they knew in the first 24 hours it was. We'll see how he handles that. I don't think Romney's going to let him off the hook that easily. The gentleman in the center. Thank you, sir. I enjoyed your presentation. I just, uh, in light of all the research you've done, I'm just wondering if, if you could comment on the incredible ability of this president to have um, kept information from the American public to the degree that he has, and you expressed it even about your own information. Um, it, it just amazes me, and I'm wondering if there's something more than just the left media that, that has uh, resulted in this. Well, he's had the media on his side, uh, to put it mildly. This media is not only rooting for him, but he's, it's complicit in everything he does, the, mass, the, the mainstream media. Um, if, if this administration has been, as John Boehner says, and I quoted him as saying, it's opaque, hard to see, it's because the mainstream media hasn't done its job. It hasn't, for instance, until my book, if I may say so, gone into the enormous, extraordinary power wielded by Valerie Jarrett. I devote two chapters in my book to her power, where it comes from, and how she exercises it, and why the Obamas allow her to have such a hold over them. You don't find that in the mainstream media. So the fact that this, there's always been a gentleman's agreement between the media and the presidency about certain things. In the past, it was about sex. So they didn't cover John Kennedy's strains, whatever you want to call them. But this media has gone far beyond that. And I think that's why he's been able to get away with not telling the public what's going on because he's not being held accountable. We have time for one more, sir. I have a follow-on to that specific point. How on earth do you get them back, the media, to telling the, the complete story? Your comment about the Reverend Wright, no exposure, this whole uh, uh, Benghazi gate, no exposure. What, what do we as America, because that is the biggest danger in our society today, in my opinion. How do we fix it, or how is it fixed? Well, it's a good question. And um, <clears throat> no. I think that's a lost cause, too, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, I, I was a member of the mainstream media, the Newsweek, the New York Times, Vanity Fair. Newsweek and the New York Times were very different publications when I was there. I, haven't, I left the Times 25 years ago. It was a very straight paper when I was there. I, I think the media is um, not remediable. I don't think we're going to be able to bring it back to where it was. I think we're in for an extended period of partisan media. But you know, we do have, we all of us here in this room should acknowledge, we do have talk radio, which is powerful and is dominated by conservative voices. And we do have Fox News Channel and Fox Business Channel. And if it weren't for Fox, and the radio and, and conservative radio talk show, I wouldn't be standing here today because my book wouldn't have done as well, but it has done very well. We are getting through to, first of all, to our side, if you will, which doesn't need persuading. And we are at least being heard by the people in the middle. 
As I said earlier on, I don't think anything that we do is going to have much of an impact on committed leftists. So um, I'm not at all hopeful that the media can be, what, brought back to where it was when all of us were a lot younger and it had a mission to tell the truth and to get at the truth. Can you imagine if Benghazi had taken place under George W. Bush? Front page headlines everywhere, day after day after day. And as um, um, Laura Ingram said, I think today in the blog, there would be reporters camped outside the homes of Hillary Clinton and Susan Rice, our UN ambassador, just the way they were when Scooter Libby was being strung up by the left-wing media under George Bush. But, the, but there is, are no media people outside those homes today. They don't want to know. So we have to band together, read the good books, listen to the good programs, and get the word out to those who we can reach. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ed Klein. Ed Klein, thank you very much. He's welcome back anytime, isn't he? Um, he'll have, I think his next book ought to be I Told You So. Um, now, he's going to the lobby where he'll be eager to sign your books. Those of you who don't have them, you may purchase them in the museum store. I want to tell you that tonight was the first time we have broadcast our programs worldwide on YouTube. So, to that, to that global audience, join us again on November 1 for Denise de Sousa, and, and uh, please, uh, uh, please uh, participate in all of our programs in the future. Thank you for coming.